we are Soramitsu. So Soramitsu is a Japanese fintech company. I founded the company three years ago. Uh, we're about 60 people now and uh, active in five countries. Uh, we created Hyperledger Iroha, which is an open source blockchain platform written in C++. So we're going to talk about this today. And uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the overview of Iroha and a few examples of how it's being used. And then later, uh, Bogdan is going to talk about uh, libp2p and how it can be applied to Iroha in the future. So we uh, we personally use Iroha in our company to make different applications for our clients. Uh, one of the clients is the Central Bank of Cambodia, uh, MBC. And um, yeah, if we have time, I can show a demo of, uh, of this app. Uh, it's a retail settlement service for the Kingdom of Cambodia, um, aimed at a, uh, daily use by 18 million people. And then uh, we've also been working with uh, different CSDs on a project called D3 Ledger. So D3 is a decentralized digital depository. And um, two years ago, uh, when we held this meetup here at Data Art, uh, one of the speakers uh, from the National Settlement Depository of Russia uh, came and talked a little bit about this project. But that was a very early um, uh, stage uh, of the project. And since then, we've done two more years of development. And uh, now we have a, a a more operable system and some other partners too. We're working also with uh, KDD in Slovenia. Um, and then finally, our company uh, was chosen by the Web3 Foundation. They're the people behind Polkadot, so with Parity. Um, and uh, uh, we were chosen to make the C++ implementation of the Polkadot runtime environment. Um, so as part, this is called a project Kagome. And so Bogdan is working on that. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then how we can take this technology and apply it to Hyperledger Iroha. Um, and feel free to interrupt me anytime if you uh, have any questions and um, or if the mic is weird or anything, I can try to, to change things. Um, so Hyperledger Iroha uh, might not be as famous as some of the other uh, projects in Hyperledger. So just to refresh everyone, um, in the Linux Foundation's Hyperledger project, there's five different blockchain platforms. Uh, the first one is called Hyperledger Fabric. This was yeah, contributed by IBM. Then there's uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth, which was contributed by Intel. Uh, we uh, contribute Hyperledger Iroha, which is number three. And then later uh, came Hyperledger Burrow, uh, which is a um, implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine in Go. And then um, uh, Hyperledger Indy, which is uh, kind of a research platform in Python uh, that's geared towards self-sovereign ident sovereign identity. So um, that's kind of the overall uh, different picture. And I can talk, if you're interested, more about uh, some comparison with the other platforms, and I'll do that maybe later. Um, but uh, I'll focus mainly on, on Iterha because that's what uh, we made. And uh, I think it's not it's not well known, so it's good to kind of explain what it is and what you can do with it. Um, so we released version one uh, in May 6th. So it's been uh, not quite two months since we released version one. And uh, this was... Um, compared with previous versions, we did uh, different performance increases and there's more reliability. We also um, had to pass an external security audit and uh, the approval of the technical steering committee. So after all these uh, steps, we finally were able to release the, uh, the project. We had worked on it for about, well, for about two years. Uh, uh, so it's, it took, it was a long road, but we finally made it. Um, Compared with some of the other projects in Hyperledger, we really focused on um, kind of end-facing applications. So uh, we put a lot of effort into software development kits that could be used by app developers, uh, both mobile and web, uh, to be able to interact with the blockchain. So um, blockchain technology is interesting, but most of the weak points in many um, applications are, are the kind of interface with the blockchain. So in Ethereum, uh, I think what ni over 90% of all the um, the queries to the Ethereum blockchain go through just one centralized API, <laughs> so running on AWS. So <laughs> it's um, it kind of defeats the purpose of blockchain in many ways. So it's important to have good uh, good software and API APIs that can be used to build um, apps in a more decentralized way. So that's one of the things that we were working on. Um, the main use cases that we focused on really were two use cases. One was uh, identity management. So uh, what's called self-sovereign identity. And we, I wrote a paper with Bogdan 
on that last year um, and that we published in IEEE. And uh, then also digital asset management. So digital asset management means the, the, the creation or issuance of different digital assets and then the, the settlement or transfer of these assets. Um, and, uh, and then we extended this technology in D3 to have uh, interledger capabilities with uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains, which is kind of cool. Um, and we have a bunch of companies, mainly in Japan, working uh, with us as use case partners. Um, so the, the one of the main differences uh, between Idroha and, uh, let's say, Fabric or Ethereum is that in Fabric and Ethereum, you have smart contracts or chain code, which uh, let you use kind of um, the ledger is a you know state machine, and you can do some kind of computation on top of this. Um, uh, in in Idroha, we you still can do some of the same types of applications, but we wanted to simplify it more. So instead of writing your own smart contracts, uh, where you have to do everything from scratch and test it, uh, you just execute a set of core commands and. Uh, commands are like like these, so there's actually more commands than this. This is just um, uh, well, it's most of the commands, but it's it's an example. Um, you can, if you want to create a new asset, like let's say let's say a currency, um, maybe data art coin or something, uh, you can do create asset, and you can create your your own asset, and then you can um, transfer it to someone else using the transfer asset command. You can add a, a quantity um, to, of the asset, and then you can maybe change the permission about who can add uh, the quantity to the asset, like this is like mining in a way. Um, so you can take all these these core commands and you can build them up together. They're like Lego pieces that you can combine to, to make more complex applications. Um, but this is still limited. I mean, you can't do everything um, that you could do in, in say a Turing complete language like Ethereum or Fabric. Um, but uh, for many use cases, we wanted to make it easy uh, for the use cases that we're, we're working on um, to just create the use case without having to, to test it. So it's, it's really made to be more developer friendly in a way. Um, along the same line, we also have what, uh, what, what's really a very simple data model. So we have what's called a domain and a domain is just like a big box that you put um, assets in and you put accounts in. And there's no limit to the number of assets or accounts that you can have in, inside the domain. And then um, each account, uh, which is really cool, each account also is, a, is by native a multi-signature account. So it has what's called uh, signatories, and you can add or remove signatures um, here, but just by adding signatory, removing signatory. And if you want to do like a M of N multi-sig account, you just set the quorum here. So in, uh, well, multi-sig's been around for a long time. So Bitcoin has had this in a long, for, for many years, but it's it's always been really cumbersome to do this in Bitcoin. Um, eth Ethereum, you're able to do this in a much easier way with smart contracts. But as you saw, maybe in the in the parity hack, there was a, a bug in the way that they made the the multi-signature contract, and uh, they lost 150 million uh, back in 2017. So um, it's really you want to have as, as little attack surface as possible when you when you build applications on top of a blockchain. And so having logic like this inside the core of the blockchain makes it much easier to test. Um, one other thing that we have is the set of permissions that are associated with each account. So permissions are like a role-based um, permission system. So you can do something like this. You can do like a decentralized governance model just using the different permission settings. Um, you can use this to model business practices. So here's an example. Um, like let's say, uh, let's say you, you, if you want to make like a virtual, um, you know, kind of governance system, you could have like a legislative type of entity and a judicial entity and executive entity, just like many countries are structured. And um, you can have a, a, a difference between the different uh, uh, or separation of powers really. So like one, um, one, like let's say, legislative uh, could could issue assets, like create new new tokens that are then um, given out to people, but um, maybe they they don't have access to send assets. So this is just only creation. So the distribution of the assets could be done by another account, and then the uh, the querying or the, the auditing of the assets could be done by like a third account. Um, so this is a permission system where. 
uh, each of the commands, you can set the permission who has access to execute this command um, on, on the asset. And this is, this is really quite, um, I think, a very robust and, and interesting way. Even, even without a, f a full smart contract engine, you can still do very complex logic uh, just in the core system, uh, which, is, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and another really cool thing is that each of these accounts can be uh, multi-signature accounts. So you can actually have teams of people that work together to do the different things. Like you can have a team of people that are uh, the asset distributors or the team of people who are the asset creators. So this is really uh, something that financial institutions or other types of corporations can use to model the business logic or the hierarchy that they have with it, within the organization. Um, so it, it's, it's really cool. Um, so that's one of the reasons to use <laughs> Idoha. Um, in Idoha, we have a set of uh, 16 commands in total and uh, 11 different queries that are, that are built into the core API. So you can take all these different commands and queries and you can combine them to make really complex logic. Um, unlike uh, some blockchains like Fabric, in Fabric you have the concept of uh, channels uh, where you can have two different parties that only have access to the core information but everyone has access to the hashes of the global ordering. Um, in Idrohav, it's more of a traditional approach. So every validating node has all the data. Uh, just like in Bitcoin or um, Ethereum. But uh, what, what you're limiting is, is who can see the data outside the network. So we have a query API with permissions that are built into the blockchain itself. So, so all the validating nodes have access to all the data um, and they use that data to validate. Uh, but they also, if you're on the outside, if you're a user, then you might have trouble, uh, you can't see the, the, the data. You, you can try to execute a query, but if you don't have permission, you can't see it. So it, 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 it gives privacy on the outside of the network. So this type of model is really good for working with some institution like a central bank, where the central bank should have access to all the transactions, but people on the outside, like a commercial bank, should only have access to their own transactions. So we do this in Cambodia where, um, the central bank runs the ledger and they can see all the transactions, but each of the commercial banks can only see the transactions that they're a part of um, and no one else can see those. So it's a segregation of, uh, of what you can see. Um, and um, one, one other thing that's unique inside the Hyperledger ecosystem is we've focused on C++ and uh, that's very performant and it's a, it's a very robust and modern language. C++ 17 is very, um, pushes the bounds of, uh, of technology and there's many new advancements over the old uh, versions of the language. Um, it does make it very complex uh, in some ways, but, um, but there's many people, millions of people in the world who can program in C++. Um, program well, well th yeah, that's a different story. Um, so what I can do to kind of make this uh, more interesting is to give some examples of, uh, of the systems that we've done. So one of them is uh, D3 Ledger. So D3 Ledger is uh, a system for, it's really a decentralized digital depository. So if you're familiar with uh, central securities depositories of a country, um, let's say you buy some Apple shares. Uh, even if the Apple shares are digital, uh, you don't own these Apple shares. They're owned by, uh, well, it, if you buy Apple shares, they're probably owned by someone like DTCC in, in the US, which is a custodian depository. So they actually take control of the asset. Uh, they just put your name on it. Um, so that's how CSDs work. And uh, what we can do in the digital realm, if you have digital security, securities or digital tokens that are issued, then you can actually have control over the asset yourself. But uh, to comply with uh, securities regulations, there has to be some custodian who um, also you know, takes charge of this asset. And so this can be used or be created by using multi-signature technology where you have the custodian in the country who's uh, one of the signatories on the account, but then you also have uh, one of the keys yourself. Um, so this is for licensed or regulated securities. Um, the idea is that, you know, after a hundred years of regulation and legal framework, that's not all going to go away. Uh, legitimate companies, uh, you know, need a legitimate way to issue tokens in a, in a legally recognized framework that, that can work internationally. Um, the cool thing is that uh, in the past, you used to have to or do these big certificates in paper, which could, uh, you know, was much harder to secure. Now, most countries have dematerialized and it's uh, digital, but still the, the whole uh, settlement system is very complex. Usually it takes several days to settle a transaction. 
So you're probably familiar with the term T plus two. Uh, for you know, after the trade, you you wait two days to do the DVP, the, the delivery versus payment settlement, where uh, you take central bank money and then you you transfer the asset. So that's how it's done now. It's very slow, but with a system like this, you can do that post-trade uh, infrastructure in real time, more or less. Um, so D3 is kind of cool. We uh, we open sourced it. I can show you the repository real quick. D3. It's just an, at GitHub.com/d3ledger. Let me zoom in here. True. So if you go to github.com slash D3 ledger, you can see some of the different um, uh, things that we have. So we used kind of uh, mostly like Kotlin or Java uh, to build the backend. Um, and um, the way it works is, so there's different things like let's say D3F. So D3F is a, um, uh, a bridge uh, to Ethereum network. So the way it works is you can lock, um, here I'll go back, here, since the text is too small anyway. What you can do is you can lock an asset, uh, like let's say Ether or an ERC20 token, you can lock it on a smart contract in on the Ethereum network, and then you have what are called notaries, and the notaries see that transaction, and they create a new asset on Idraha using multi-signature technology uh, to create the asset on Idraha, and then you can move it around. It's a permission system, and then you can take it back out if you want using the bridge. Um, so this is, this is, Kind of, it's a one step towards the goal of interoperability that maybe Polkadot or Cosmos uh, has been working towards. Except this, you know, works now, which is really cool. Um, but I, I didn't want to talk about D3 too much. I wanted to um, kind of go through th this uh, this sample application because I think this illustrates uh, some of the cool things about Idraha uh, related to digital identity. Um, so if you were to go to our our homepage, soremitsu.co.jp, and then uh, go. To, you can click here on, on Idraha, and then go here where it says details. Uh, this is like uh, a website that has many different resources and information uh, on Idraha. This is not an official Hyperledger website, but it's a website we built um, just to provide information. So there's like different information about Idraha and how cool it is. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you go down here to examples, um, there's different examples that are if you, a good way to learn uh, the system. Uh, and I'll focus on this one. It's called Idraha Messenger, but uh, it's not a messenger. It's a, like a Twitter app. Um, so this was made by one of our employees, Dimitru, uh, who I th he's from Moldova, which is close by. Um, but uh, so this is, this is kind of a, it, it tells you how to deploy it. But um, I have handily uh, a little video, which I can show you. Um, to kind of go through this. So what he's doing is uh, he's setting up, um, here, I'll mute him. So, let's see here. So so th this source code here, if you go to uh, main colon, so there's, it's really simple example. <laughs> Examples should be simple. So there's two things here. There's a main uh, colon file and a post colon file. In the main file, uh, what you have, uh, this is not secure, by the way, <laughs> because we're just putting the keys in the <laughs> in, in the in line here. But this is for the example. So, what what this app does is it uh, it it uh, it basically creates a decentralized Twitter um, on on top of the Idraha blockchain. Um, so it creates an account or a set of accounts and, uh, that are associated with these keys, and then each account can make a tweet, basically. So the way the tweets work is uh, in Idraha. Every account has a key value map. This is called um, uh, account detail, or is it account info or account detail? One of these. Um, let me look at the post here, because this will tell me. Yeah, account detail. So every account has an account detail uh, associated with it. And this is a key value map. So you can store just text data here or any kind of data um, inside this map. And um, he he took this feature and made a Twitter application out of it. So let me just walk through uh, the code here. So in the video, what he was doing is actually going through and setting up um, uh, the Genesis block that defines the the, uh, the accounts with the key pairs here. Um, but let's see. So the main file, all it does is just queries for um, uh, in any account detail, things that have a tag tweet in it. So these are the tweets that you have. And um, in this example, all the tweets will be 
put like one tweet in a block, and so uh, each tweet would is in the order of the of the blocks that you get from the uh, query. But what's interesting really is the post code line. So let's go through this. So if you want to to write data uh, using the the uh, Java library that we have, um, it's really simple. So what you do in Iroha is you create a transaction using the transaction uh, dot builder uh, method, and then you can call set account detail. Um, you have to give it the ID um, of the account. Here we're just using the the admin account just to make it simple, uh, and then you you give it a key and a value. So uh, here you're giving it um, just like the key tweet and the value would be like hello world. <laughs> this would be like the first tweet that you're giving. And then if you wanted to write something else, you just have to change the string. So if you could, you could in theory like create like a front end app where you just, um, you know, take text and put it in. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, where do we uh, add the payload to the transaction? So um, the way this works is the transaction builder uh, you you call the command that you want, uh, and you set the the data, and then you call dot sign with the with the key that you have, and then this actually signs this uh, transaction, and then build will um, build will take it and uh, actually like put it in a format that can be accepted by the network, um, and uh, transaction sync is where you this Bogdan this is where you broadcast it right to transa transaction sync. Okay, yeah. So you build the transaction here, and this you sign it first, and then building it, I guess, just packages it into the f the byte array that's needed, and then you can send that to the network uh, using this. Well, this is the synchronous call, and I think there's an async uh, call as well. Yeah, go ahead. How many accounts detail I can uh, add from the one transaction? So how many can you add? Is there a limit? In theory, there's no limit. Um, you, you you could in uh, in practice, you could probably have some performance issues depending on the memory of the of the computer. But um, uh, in one block, what what's the command limit in a block? Do you know? I I don't remember what it is because uh, I think well I think it's configurable, so it, it doesn't matter that much. But you you can set there's there should be some kind of limit into the number of commands you can have in a single block, uh, and then that that would be kind of the limit that you would have in a single transaction. So um, in one transaction, you can actually uh, execute multiple commands, as you see. So you could do, uh, from here, you could also do like some other command um, on the same uh, on the same account or in the same uh, transaction, um, which, which can be useful for things like swapping uh, different assets. So if you want to swap two assets, you could potentially do it that way. I'm not sure how uh, this, the signing would work in that case, though. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me just show you the, the demo video that uh, Dimitri put together, which is kind of cool. Um, so he actually goes through and he um, he does two different tweets. So uh, what is he doing here? So he's just deploying um, this example. And then he, this is the same code that you have on GitHub. Uh, so. This is how you query the block, uh, is, is really how that goes. So you have like a block subscriber and you can query um, uh, the account details uh, on, the, on the blockchain using the query builder. So this is just the setup uh, of the network because he's setting up a new network uh, at the beginning. So this is, let's see if I can pause this somehow. Jeez. Uh, Let's go back. Okay, let me just explain what what the transaction builder is doing. So, what it's doing here is, uh, so you're getting a transaction list uh, from from the the block uh, subscriber, and then you um, you you go through and you you look for the command list in the in the blocks, and you look for um, the command uh, set account detail. So it, it's looking for all the transactions where you set the account details. And then it's um, it's it's then filtering these where the key is tweet, so you could have like many different transactions uh, all with the same key. And then uh, for each of these transactions, you're just printing out the um, the account ID and the value is uh, is what the query does. It's really simple. Um, 
So it's going through this. This is the, the hello world example. So this is just going to create a set account detail transaction and put it um, with hello world. And he runs it and then uh, he runs post, which should write hello world. And then he'll run main, which uh, should show. Um, uh, uh, okay, so so it committed, and then you can see admin admin at test and hello world. So th the account ID is admin at test. That's another point in Idroha. All the accounts are 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 not like a, in Bitcoin where you have like a long address, but just a simple string. So you have the domain, which would be like test, and the uh, the username, which is like admin. Or it could be anything. It could be Mikhail. I don't know. <laughs> so you can see he also did a uh, changed it to be Hello Cambodia, and then it prints. It prints in order because it it just goes through uh, the blocks in in order. So you could have um, you could have like a Twitter app uh, that no one can shut down. <laughs> um, would be would be the idea. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to kind of go to the example again. If you want to go there, you can get to it uh, by going to our homepage, going to Iderha, clicking on details, and then going to examples down here at the bottom. And then the it's called Iderha Messenger, but it's not a messenger. Iderha Tweet, Twitter. Um, so that's one easy to see example, I think. Um, so. The cool thing about this account details, you can actually create robust applications about this. So Bogdan and I last year um, published a paper on digital identity. Um, and we actually uh, worked with um, with the bank in uh, Indonesia to, to build a POC um, uh, based on this. So the bank is uh, Bank Central Asia. It's the largest uh, non-government bank in Indonesia. Um, so there's a problem we, we try to solve. So in, in uh, one of the problems is when customers come to, to onboard, uh, so BC has a big financial groups. So they have like banks, they have insurance companies, they have um, finance, microloans, security company, all kinds of things. They even have two banks. They have a Sharia bank for Muslims and a regular bank. Um, so um, if you want to open an account at, at the bank and then get like a loan at the finance, you have to do KYC twice. Um, you have to send all your documents and data and it, it, it's a pain. Um, another problem is that there's no group standard for identity. So uh, none of these group companies can share any information about a customer because they don't have any, any way to talk about this. So if you, if you do something bad, like with your loan, um, maybe it's, it takes a long time for other companies to find out uh, that that you did that. Um, so that's kind of what we played around with is like you can use the account detail uh, feature in Idroha to annotate information about uh, different customers. Um, but the cool thing is that each of the things that you annotate can be done in a kind of a what's called a self-sovereign way. So uh, I, let's see. I you can make what are called verifiable claims um, about uh, what's called a decentralized identifier. So um, in, the, in, this, in the protocol that Bogdan uh, helped develop, uh, you, have, you use the W3C uh, DID, which is a decentralized identifier, and you can make verifiable claims on it. So a DID is really just um, some unique key uh, where the ID is globally unique. Um, so no one else will have the same ID uh, for, for a key that you have. And then it just says who the owner of this key is. And then once you have this, this public key, then you can make different annotations about this. And you can make different annotations about this ID. So uh, just to give an example of what a verifiable claim um, looks like. Here. So a verifiable claim uh, that when you write data to the blockchain in the set account detail, you have to be very careful because uh, you can never delete it because <laughs> it's immutable. So you never want to put any personally identifiable information in the blockchain. That would just be really stupid. Um, so what you do is you put a verifiable claim that's public. Um, and then this information is just uh, random numbers if, if anyone sees it. 
Um, the idea is that uh, there's no information if you don't know what it's about. <laughs> um, so there's a, a private part and a public part. And the private part, uh, let's just say, is like a JSON array. And this is from the W3C uh, spec for ver verifiable claims. Um, you have an ID. And the ID is the decentralized identifier, the ID that I just showed you. And then you'd have uh, some private information, like let's say name is Bogdan. And then um, to prevent, uh, because this is going to be then hashed, uh, to prevent brute forcing the hash and to comply with GDPR, you have to put a salt in it. And uh, in reality, you wouldn't use <laughs> you wouldn't use salt two or something. You would use like a really uh, long random number, like uh, 256 bits or 512 bits or something. Um, so no one could possibly brute force it. Um, so you you create these data, and then you can make different claims uh, on these. So Different claims like that can can be put into numbers like this. This is kind of abbreviated to fit on the slide, but um, what you can do is you can have like a bank. Uh, here, the issuer is not a bank. The issuer is Bogdan, um, <laughs> which is he's making a claim about himself, I guess, that my name is Bogdan. Um, so the, the the claims that are made are, are just like random numbers. But if you know the the ID the claim is made about, and you know the uh, uh, the name and the salt, uh, then you can you can verify that that this claim is correct. That it was because uh, what's being ha what's happening is this is being hashed and then signed by uh, the key associated with um, with uh, with the ID here, and and everyone knows what the public key is because it's in the uh, decentralized identifier as the public key. So, so you just kind of put all that together. And in the W3C spec, you can have different representations of the key. So it could be base 58, could be other, other ways to, to write it. Um, and so this is just, you know, not to go into complete detail, but uh, it just shows you how you would do this in, in practice. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't write someone's name into the blockchain, but you, instead you have to obfuscate it in a different way. You, you know, you salt it, you hash it, you sign it, and then, then you can verify it. So we did this uh, for BCA. Um, and uh, what we did was we made an app uh, like this, where you can just scan your passport and take your photo, and then you know put different information about yourself in the app. And then it gets uploaded uh, to like a desktop application that the bank runs, and then the bank um, uh, creates these verifiable claims that are associated with the ID. And this, let's see, and th th there's other ways to do this. So one example of how this would be used in practice would be, um, I'm a new user, uh, I want to open a bank account. So first I create, I install the app, the app creates a DID uh, for myself, um, and I write this to the, to the blockchain. Um, this goes into my account detail. <clears throat> then I go to bank A, I say, give me an account. Um, <laughs> I give them my information. Bank A then um, takes this information. They, you know, they salt it, they hash it, then they sign it, uh, associated it with my ID. And they can put this um, in the blockchain uh, in, in a number of places, but they can put it in my uh, account detail, so it's easy to find. So you can see that the bank wrote some information about me uh, into the blockchain. But so everyone who knows the bank's public key can see, oh, this, this was written by uh, this bank. We don't know what the information is, though. Then uh, I go to bank B, and I say, I want to open an account with you. Um, and so I give, uh, I give bank B my information. Um, uh, th this is uploaded automatically from the app. Uh, now, t to streamline the onboarding process, bank B doesn't want to, to do all the verification again. So what they do is they go to bank A and say, do you know this customer? And uh, bank A says, yes, I do. Here's the, here's the proof. Here's the, the private part of the ver verifiable claim. Uh, and then you can read the verifiable claim from the blockchain and you can you know, verify that it's correct, that I really did go through and verify the customer. So that's, uh, that's one of the, um, the, way the, the ways this uh, can work. Um, and um, we, we kind of expanded this some more uh, to make an app where uh, you can onboard users uh, remotely. And this is actually being integrated into the application for the Central Bank of uh, Cambodia, where, uh, okay, ignore the sign up, it's not important. Um, 
what you do is you take a selfie, which is like a video, and then the video is doing some liveness detection. Um, and you'll, you'll see it in a second. Um, so you, the selfie is like actually a video, and it's doing a, a lot of liveness detection here to, to make sure that it's not like a still image. And then uh, take the passport, um, then it, it reads this information um, automatically, and then it uh, it does some cool things like uh, compare uh, the face with the face that's on your ID card, and then like compute the liveness uh, detection, the liveness score. So, so you get you get uh, a face matching score and a confidence score. So this this can help you on onboard uh, clients in a remote way. And so, um, this information can also be written to the blockchain um, associated with an account if if you if you needed to. So that's uh, that's one of the uh, things that we've been working on now, um, and I'll just kind of close here by uh, by saying you know there's a lot of different applications that that you can do um, on on Hyperledger Roja. Um, you, I mean any blockchain you can do a lot of cool things. We we just try to make it really easy uh, to do. Uh, Iroha is not good for everything. Uh, we don't have a Turing complete smart contract language. So if you want to do really weird or crazy things, um, maybe it's not the best. But maybe you could also restructure your uh, application so that it, it it doesn't need that because um, <laughs> um, most most of the time you don't want to be able to do everything because it makes it very hard to test um, and uh, and we're yeah so it's it's really good in a permission setting that uh, that you can work with um, enterprise use we've been kind of pushing the bounds uh, of this recently with a project called Sora so Sora is a decentralized autonomous economy so uh, what that means is it's not just a currency or a token, but it's an economic system that goes with it. So what does that mean? What is an economic system? So most of the time people think about a currency like Bitcoin or something. Um, but there's you need to be an economic system, you need a, a way to um, to manage quantities. So <laughs> that what I, what I mean is you need a way to manage the distribution of uh, of these tokens in an economy. And uh, if you want to have a good economy, the to newly minted uh, tokens should be allocated for productive uses, so like creating new goods and services. So um, what we have here in Sora is we, we allow an in infinite amount of currency to be minted, but uh, the, the allocation is decided by the people. Um, it, it's not really infinite because it's limited really by the projects that you can do. So people propose a project. Um, and then the community holds a referendum to vote on it. And if the vote passes, you mint uh, new tokens and you give it to the project. Then the project uh, builds this project. It, it should contribute to the ecosystem and should kind of go up. So the intuition here is that uh, for systems like Bitcoin, every day $10 million are being minted. Um, so Bitcoin's currently inflationary. Um, but uh, this $10 million is just being sold by miners to pay for electricity, which is not really... Uh, sustainable. So we wanted to to kind of take this and use it for um, for productive uses. And so we have a, a way where we calculate reputation and we give out votes, and the votes are, um, are then given out to to people. And the technology being used is really on top of D3 Ledger. So um, this is a, like a token issuance on top of D3. And the cool thing is because it's kind of a set of blockchains, you can take this token that's created on Hyperledger Iroha which is a private ledger, and you can move it onto a public blockchain like uh, uh, like Ethereum, which is really, um, I think, going to be really cool. And in the future, maybe take it to like Polkadot and things like that. So um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I guess we have time for a question or two. So is it? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. So um, what what we have right now is that when you create an asset on Hyperledger Iroha, and then through D3 you take it out into Ethereum, uh, it becomes the ERC20 token standard. So um, it only works for simple assets. So uh, things like account details and stuff we don't have uh, support for for Ethereum. So thanks for listening. Hopefully that was interesting. <laughs>